So one. You might hear a little bit of background noise. It's working from home and presenting from home business. You might hear a bit of food preparation. You might hear the, the trials and tribulations of children playing games from time to time. So I hope that's not too distracting for you. And so well, at this stage for our 59 participants, welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us for the Increasing Soil Carbon <coughs> Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation presentation brought to you by Neil and Bickshire Council. My name is Ian Colbard. Hopefully you can see it there in my name. I'm the Sustainability Officer with Council. Been there a couple of years and great place to work. And about a year ago, we were fortunate enough to welcome Stephanie O'Reeve into the flock and she's taken on the role of land management officer and she's provided great inspiration and a lot of energy and a lot of drive in the last 12 months that she's been there and presenting webinars like this is, is part of connecting with the community in our new way of communicating. So as you can see, you aren't necessarily able to ask questions directly. There's a chance to get into the chats, Q and A. Um, so if you have a question, we'd really appreciate if you were to log your question into the Q and A function and we've enabled it so that participants can also see the questions and answer the questions together, not just us. You know, this is working from the point that we are the collective genius. It's not just two people that you can see. There's now 67 participants that can actually share the knowledge. So uplift us all. Um, hopefully all goes to plan. We can never guarantee everything will work as it should, but we'll do our best to make it At least it, work it wasn't for you. last Thursday because probably we'd have no power. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm oh, starting yeah. on a good note, really good note. Oh, we're, we're flying this week. We've got, we've got water and power this week. Yes. Um, <laughs> so there will be opportunities to ask questions. There'll be a few, a poll um, through the course of the presentation. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Wurundjeri people the traditional custodians of the lands and waters that we are presenting from today. And may you also recognise the traditional custodians of the lands and waters wherever you are and pay your respects to the land and the people and all of the species that you share it with. Now, this is a council presentation um, and we really hope that if there's anything else we can do to support you through this process, let us know. If there's anything we can follow up with, let us know. There'll be time for questions and answers at the end. Um, but enough from me, please, Stephanie O'Reeve, um, our wonderful land management officer, can take it over. Thanks, Ian, that was a nice introduction. Oh. Ian is also a permaculture guru and a uh, bit of a biochar expert as well. So if you have any questions related to those topics or um, other, please just chuck them in the chat and um, we'll try to answer them. So I'm gonna be talking about how we can sequester and safely store carbon in soil tonight. Most, mostly uh, when we think about storing carbon, it's we think about storing it in above ground biomass, so storing it in the bodies of trees, but soil is a fantastic um, place to safely put carbon and has huge functional benefits for us. These are the key messages I'd like you to take home today. I'm going to go through a bit about what is soil, its structure, what's in it, where's the carbon bits in soil and the organic carbon bits and how we can influence those carbon pools um, to enhance the function of our soil but also um, help us ad adapt and um, mitigate some climate change issues. So when we're, and then, so that's the first part. And then we'll be talking about what we can do at home and practical tips for all types of properties in and around Nillambic, whether that's just your backyard or um, bush, large bushland spaces or in um, pasture situations. Now we're going to dive in and learn about soil composition, structure and carbon pools. Nice. Where is organic carbon stored on planet Earth? 
in the top one meter of the Earth's crust, there's actually three times as much organic carbon than is in the atmosphere. We know that the amount of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere has increased through land use change, um, agric poor agricultural practices, deforestation and fossil fuel burning. And we also know that the ocean has um, done a fair bit of the heavy lifting um, for us in um, absorbing some of the carbon, excess carbon that we've emitted. However, soils uh, represent a fantastic place to put back some of this carbon and to undo some of the damage of past poor management. So now we're going to have a look at exactly where and how carbon is stored in soil. Today I'm going to be really focusing in on the O horizon, O and well A horizon of the soil. So that's the just the upper crust, the top soil. As we get further down towards our bedrock, there's relatively little organic materials in there, organic carbon, um, because we don't have plants, um, plant roots getting down that deep. This pie chart off to the left is the composition of a well-structured loam soil. Within the mineral component, we have particles of sand, silt and clay, and the various, uh, the ratios of those, those bits determine whether we have a really clayey soil or a sandy soil or something nice and loamy in the middle. There, within a good soil, we should also find plenty of air and water. We know that uh, all living things need to um, drink and breathe, so we need to have well-structured soil um, full of little pockets of air and little pockets of water. Within the organic fraction, this 5% approximately, we have organic matter. And organic matter is anything that was or is living. Within this fraction, um, it's about 50% carbon, but then it's also got oxygen, nitrogen, um, hydrogen and all those other um, atoms that we would find in um, organic, you know, large organic co compounds. So now we're going to delve in and we're going to have a closer look at exactly what types of carbon are in that organic matter. There are actually three. On the left we have particulate carbon and these are, I guess, relatively large bits about you know, two millimetres, and they are the um, somewhat decomposed parts of plants and animals. They've still got plenty of energy left in them. So when we think about the composting process, they've got still plenty of um, bonds to break and still plenty of, of digestion available, but for um, our soil life. Um, so it's a relatively labile pool, it's not overly stable. We don't expect that the particulate carbon I have in my soil today to be the same stuff I have next week. We expect this pool to be constantly ticking over, turning over and fertilizing our soil, feeding our soil. The next category is humic carbon. This is much more stable than the partic particulate carbon and it is the basically the bodies of dead microbes. It's medium stability and um, medium energy, so less energy than the particulate carbon, but still a great source of um, nutrition for growing plants and really functional um, in terms of providing soil structure and soil um, stability and gluing soil particles together. Also holding water. Then on the right we have resistant charcoal. This is the this is this type of carbon is the product of burning. So when we have fire go through the landscape, there is charcoal that remains, and that is very that sits in the landscape. It's very resistant. It has some of the functional properties of the other types of carbon, but there's no energy in it. Like nothing can break it apart and and make it food. Um, so it just sits, it's just like particulate carbon and humic carbon, they all have great water holding capacity, um, but it, it's, a, it's very low energy, very stable. 
the good thing is it doesn't go anywhere. Steph? Yeah? So just on that point about the resistance of the, um, the charcoal oh. and the point you made earlier about biochar, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of capacity for people if you're not overly aware of the capacity of char to improve soil structure and soil fertility to do a little bit of research into biochar, which we can actually do ourselves. Um, and the capacity for the incredibly large surface area of the charcoal to provide habitat, I suppose, for microorganisms. Mm. And that sort of really can provide a catalyst for living soils in some respects anyway, and acting like a sponge to hold water. Yeah, fantastic. Right. There's my few seconds worth on that. Thank you. That was great. You're welcome. Um, I should also add that um, depending on the type of organic matter, we can have one gram of organic matter can hold up to 20 grams of water. So even just making a slight increase in the amount of organic matter our soil holds can have enormous um, payoffs in terms of how much water our soil can hold and um, carry us through dry periods. For the sake of today's talk, I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be focusing in on the humic carbon pool. Um, and how we can influence it through the management of our land. Building soil humus, there are three processes in order to do, in, in the three processes we can use to do that, that plants use to do that. They all start with photosynthesis. The first one is probably the most obvious. It's above ground litter cycling. So if you imagine a growing plant, or a tree, let's say, drops leaves, it drops litter, bits and twigs and the bodies of plants. And that material breaks down over time, basically composts at the soil surface. So at that interface with um, the topsoil, which is a fantastic reservoir of moisture and microbes, we have things constantly turning over. So that's one process. The next one is root sloughing. When plants are growing, depending on what type of plants they are, but we have um, periodic sloughing of roots. Some plants don't like to have um, more biomass above the ground than below the ground. So if they have a haircut or they have dieback or they get eaten, then what, how much leaves they have will match how much the roots they have and they'll just shed roots. And those roots when they decay, um, form lovely little tunnels into the, into the soil profile and can be fantastic for moving water and air into the soil profile and really contribute positively to soil structure. The third category is one that we think about less, that less people know about, but it's actually the most important. And that is sugary root exudates. It's not something we can necessarily see, but we know that when a plant is photosynthesizing, up to 40% of the total carbohydrate produced from photosynthesis goes into this third process. So when a plant's growing, it can absorb various things from the soil in, in, to meet its needs. However, it has a really, it's very important to, it has a relationship with all its soil microbes, especially fungi and bacteria and all the rest. Um, and that relationship is um, reciprocal. And basically fungi will trade with the plant and say the plant will give the fungi sugars and in exchange, the fungi will make minerals available. So for example, if this plant needed some phosphorus, it would secrete some um, root exudates, would encourage the fungi over, and the fungi would make the minerals available to the plant. So we need to harness these three processes in order to positively build the function of our landscape. When our management is regenerative, the landscape can exist in a carbon positive feedback loop, meaning that we can enrich soil on a continuous basis. So when things are going right, we have more photosyn photosynthesis, which means we can store more soil organic carbon by those three 
humic building processes. Then that humic carbon, we know one gram of organic matter stores up to 20 gram, holds up to 20 grams of water. So from that carbon, we can have more water holding capacity. In the Australian landscape, we have plenty of sun, but water is almost always the limiting factor for plant growth. So holding a little bit more water makes a huge difference in terms of promoting plant, plant growth, storing more carbon, more water holding capacity, and that is how we build soil over time in the landscape and enrich soil with carbon over time in the landscape. However, it's a fine balance and if we, if there's, if there's something compromising the ability of our landscape to do any one of these processes, then we get stuck and the cycle goes backwards. And in the context of climate change, keeping this cycle going positively, going forward, is very important for climate resilience. So the water holding capacity is super important to um, keep the landscape going between periods of drought. Imagine if we have, if we're moving to a time where we have very erratic large storms and then less little um, rainfall events in between, we need the landscape to be able to hold that water. Yeah. On the mitigation side of things, sequestering carbon in soil has means it's not in the atmosphere and that's exactly what we need to do. At COP21, um, in, uh, the French government made a commitment to sequestering soil carbon in their agricultural um, landscapes. So they committed to increasing soil carbon by 0.4% um, every year. And in doing so, taking carbon safely out of the atmosphere and also um, promoting food security. I think, Steph, it could also be said that a fair, a fair amount of the Australian response to, I suppose, sequestration is in the land use category as well. Um, yeah, definitely. For, for reducing for reducing overall emissions. Definitely. So that's where we are in terms of the theory side of things. Um, and we can start moving into what what that means at home. Do is there anyone any questions so far? Um, any feedback? You're on mute. Mm. Thank you. At this stage, <laughs> at this stage, there's no additional questions. I think everyone's just taking it in for now. All right. So now we're going to dive into what can we be doing at home? And obviously, we've got a diverse audience and some people are in managing little small blocks of land, backyards, other people might be managing very large properties. Um, maybe they've got undertaking some kind of agriculture, maybe it's bushland conservation, who knows. Um, but we're going to discuss um, lots of strategies and lots of examples of all different types of properties. I'm going to start with um, bushland and then we're going to move into pasture and then into the garden. I'd also like to add that building soil carbon is a very slow and, and steady process. It's not something that happens rapidly, but it's something that we need to just chip away at and make sure that we're pointing in the right direction and just consistently building, consistently feeding that pool of soil microbes. So let's start with bushland. In healthy bushland like this, so this is a grassy dry forest, we can see that this, this landscape's probably doing a great job of sequestering carbon without much human intervention. It's got a healthy coverage of um, mixed um, ground covers under the canopy species. It's got plenty of grasses and sedges, um, peas, other wildflowers. So, so that diversity of plant species means that we've got a diversity of sugary root exudates also entering the soil and that feeds a diversity of microbes. 
if we had um, a large storm event or we had a period of, of extreme dry, there's enough uh, mulch covering the soil. There is um, leaf litter, there's plenty of coverage of living plants to catch leaf litter to prevent it, um, or sediment to prevent it, prevent it moving off the site. Um, so there's lots, um, there's lots that we can learn from a healthy landscape like this. The diversity of microbes would also be providing um, lots of immunity benefits to the plants in this landscape, so helping them fight off pests and diseases. Succession is, would be happening too. So um, it's uh, a healthy landscape where we can have um, plant, you know, plants of all ages. We've got new species, new plants germinating all the time. There's no need to replant because the landscape is re constantly regenerating itself. Steph, yeah. excuse me, Steph, can I just say, is this image a, a Nilambic example? Uh, I believe so. Okay. But where do people say it is? Oh, it's not that. It's just sort of trying to get a sort of a feeling for the typical landscape that are, um, some of the Nilambic bushland so, represents. So if anyone's from a different area, this is perhaps representative of the portions of the landscape that we were working. So it's a, it's a fairly impacted landscape, it could, it could be said. Um, hence the trying to return the, the health to the landscape. Yeah, so I guess managing bushland is very much dependent on um, where you are, what kind of site you're managing, what aspect is it, um, and what like what type of vegetation. So super, what what is healthy in, in one space would be completely different to what is healthy in another space, but there are take homes that <clears throat> will be um, reflected in, in all landscapes. So we've seen what a healthy landscape looks like, and now we're gonna start looking at well, what are those threats? And I've got a, uh, an asterisk on this one because especially in the Nilambic context, one of our most serious threats is a new threat and that's deer. So when we have the landscape working well and we've got that positive feedback loop, photosynthesis, increasing soil organic matter, increasing water holding capacity, we have, when we have deer come into the landscape, they really, and they eat lots, and um, really compromise the photos the, at the photosynthesis point, then we're just not getting that normal function in the landscape. And we end up with what was healthy bushland that looks like this. So in this photo off to the left, we can see this is a, a little grass and it's it's been chronically overgrazed. So it would have had a lovely um, thick story of, of leaves and then it's been eaten and then it's regrown again and it's been eaten again and again and again and again. And there's only so much root energy you can mobilise before you can't regrow any more leaves. And that's how we end up with um, so much bare area. And in this right photo, um, there's a lot of litter that if we had a big rainfall event, how much would stay and how much would move, how much would just run down the hill? Because really we wanna be holding all that lovely mulch um, to keep soil protected, keep it cool. Um, but we've, we've lost all the, those living ground cover species. So this landscape would struggle when we add heavy climate change impacts. Yeah, and, and Steph, just following up, you mentioning this is um, largely the result of um, overgrazing, particularly by pest species. In this particular property, it was the the big new the big change was yeah. Okay, I think it's a as a bit of a segue. Um, Michelle Hanslow, one of our officers, has just popped a little note into into the Q and A that Neil and Big's also running a deer webinar on Saturday the 12th of September from 2 till 4. I did so, actually have a note about that in two slides time, but that's okay. Sorry. We've, we've got to go yeah. hard. <laughs> we'll do it anyway. Do it again. 
but yeah, yeah check out the web, Neil and Vic website if you want to log into that one too. Yeah, awesome. Very good. So managing excess browsing in the landscape is really, really challenging. I appreciate that it, it's, it's a bit of a wicked problem. It's not, there's no real easy fix. However, um, we can undertake monitor, monitoring relatively easily and that can guide us, inform us what the extent of the damage is and then um, how much action we need to take and when we need to take action. So this was property, this is the property in, in Bend of Island and um, there is very heavy brew, deer, wallaby and um, rabbit grazing on this site. However, the landholder can, has constructed some of these little plots that are, so they're completely rabbit proof and I don't think the wallabies really like to hop into them and the roos do hop into them and the deer can technically, but they take the browsing pressure off just enough that inside the fence there is, um, this is a newly constructed plot, so you can't really see it, but in other plots constructed, there's been a really strong resurgence in um, ground covers and herbs and peas in, in his other plots. So it's just a nice little, it's not, it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't fix it on the landscape scale, but it's a nice little monitoring tool to say that, you know, if we did get, if we did, you know, have the tools or the means to get these, to tackle these problems, what kind of landscape um, positive impacts we could have. This is a complete exclusion plot. On the right hand side, you can see that there's quite a bit more litter in and around the grasses and um, outside the plot, there's a bit, quite a bit more bare soil and less uh, litter stability. Also deer impacted. This site, um, if you are ever driving around, when you can drive around, when you can leave your 5K bubble, I should add, um, if you see rabbit coops or any other kind of cages on hard rubbish, do pick them up because they make fantastic little exclusion test patches. So this site was um, really struggling with Patterson's Curse and we wondered, well, how much is um, excess browsing pressure because animals will selectively go for the grasses over the Patterson's, Patterson's Curse and um, we wondered how much was excess browsing pressure contributing to um, the weakness of the weeping grass and therefore it not being able to crowd out the Patterson's curse. So this was a really simple um, little experiment and we're just um, taking photos regularly and it doesn't necessarily change what's happening on, in the bigger picture but it can roughly inform us that you know, what's happening comp outside compared to inside the box, um, how we might take action. Steph, so Tom, in just on a little test like this, are there, um, assuming this is your example or a known example, are there any surprises, anything coming up that was, has proved a surprise or, um, it's like, this, oh, didn't expect this box, that. I think we put out, ooh, I think we put out last spring. So, I'm very curious to know what is happening in it now. This photo was actually from a few months ago. Um, but I am expecting the weeping grass to be looking much more vigorous under the cage and much fewer annual broadleaf species, but that is my hypothesis. I haven't actually seen it yet. When I can, when I can leave home, I look forward to going visiting. So we've examined some of the challenges of excess browsing and grazing in the landscape, but then you say, well, what do I do about it? The good news is that council can help. So we know that landscape scale can, uh, pest animal control works best. So do coordinate with your neighbors, see who, where, where there's interest and can you coordinate to set up say a, a rabbit or a deer action group? Um, we have a land management incentive program within council where we can help co-fund that work in some areas of the Shire. So do get in touch if 
you're struggling with these issues. And yes, another shameless plug for Michelle's dear webinar. So once we've controlled um, excess browsing, then we can look at planting opportunities and um, support of the landscape with revegetation re activities. When you're choosing to do any planting on your property, there's lots of variables to consider. So just like when determining is a site healthy or not and what should be there, what shouldn't be there, um, we want to um, plant according to the site, the aspect, the um, what type of um, bushland or what type of vegetation it is. It can also be really valuable to say, well, this this site, maybe it's got great canopy cover or um, great ground story, but it's really missing a shrub layer. So what, what's missing in the landscape and what's what are those low hanging fruit planting activities that will make the biggest impact um, with fewer plants? Maybe it's a really tricky site, so you might choose seed balls. Um, whatever works really. Um, another idea might be do be guided by what's on your roadside or what's in a little patch of remnant vegetation nearby. If you're, say you're, um, you're revegetating a site that was um, modified heavily for agriculture, then there might not be many clues to tell you what's, what should be there, but what's happening on the roadside or other little pockets can give you hints and what might go well. Do keep trying, things die, that's okay. Um, just keep at it and um, do guard carefully. Tall guards, definitely very tall guards. So these are just another few shots of um, what we're looking for in healthy bush. So this was quite a, a wet, um, south facing slope and we can see here that uh, there's a little tiny bit of bare soil down at the bottom right hand corner but for the most part we can't see any soil because it's all thoroughly covered in a variety of um, plant material and litter and we can see that the litter is quite stable because at the top of the picture we can see the, the leaves um, that are in a state of somewhat uh, in a state of decay they've been there for quite a while and they haven't moved so it's a really good good sign that our our landscape is, is doing what it needs to do and functioning really well um, on the left we have inside an exclusion pot and on the outside we is on the right we can see that there's quite a few bare spots outside and um, really thick litter coverage inside. If we think about how this site might cope if we have a heat wave, um, which, which site's going to have more soil microbial dieback or um, which, you know, if we have a string of 45 degree days, which, which soil will remain cooler? So they're the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about when we're making decisions about managing land and keeping the soil well covered, um, well mulch well, and especially covered in living plants is the best thing we can do. So let's say, you know, we're really stuck. We um, need to get some plants in the ground, but we're we're starting at kind of bare bones. We can use some structural helping tools um, to protect our plants and protect our soil while everything grows and, and, and can stabilise the site we're managing. So this is a relatively extreme example of coir logs, um, but we can see that they're holding up this quite steep site and um, while the ultimately plants get going, um, build big stable root systems and anchor this site back in place. You might just use single logs um, or 
single coil logs in your, on your property, um, just on contour, and you'd be surprised how much uh, leaf litter and sediment you can trap behind them. And in those little pockets behind the logs, uh, it's amazing how much um, um, lovely um, silt and sediment we can um, trap, and that's a perfect environment for growing new plants. So we're coming to an end of the bushland segment and we're moving into pasture. Sorry, I'm not Steph. sure how many, yeah? Yeah, just um, before we move out of the bushland situation, mm -hmm. there's just popping in a question um, that's been asked. It might sort of generate a few different thoughts around burning off in terms of reducing ground litter and how this mm -hmm. affects the carbon in the soil. So if, you, if you might be able to give a few thoughts on it, we can always come back to it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's always thoughts within the group. So if you've got thoughts as well, you can maybe pop that into the chat as well. Yeah, so I guess burning is one um, strategy we might use to reduce the total amount of leaf litter or kind of that surface mulch, but when we do burn, we lose, we might end up with like that little bit of that charcoal fragment, um, but we do lose a huge amount as CO2. And um, we, I guess in, in terms of the life cycle analysis, we, we lose a lot more when we choose the burn pathway compared to the um, uh, composting pathway. And when I say composting, I mean like getting that, um, particulate carbon breakdown and keeping um, that litter breaking down, turning over. Obviously we don't want enormous thick litter because that is, that's not healthy either. Um, yes, it, it can be a real fire risk and um, when it, it's really, it's too thick, it, it doesn't break down very well. So there is a sweet spot in terms of the quantity of litter, but we want it constantly breaking down, turning over. Um, one of the challenges in Australia is that we used to have loads and loads of little digging mammals. And um, I read a really nice article yesterday in The Age. Um, Alex Maisie has a new paper about how uh, superb lyrebirds turn over 11 garbage trucks worth of forest um, litter in each year. So obviously the lie, we don't, that's that's not a nilimbic example but having you know that active turnover of litter and bringing fresh you know fresh un uh, composted litter into con into the contact with into contact with soil and soil moisture and soil microbes where it can be broken down when we don't have that function in the landscape because we've we've lost it through mainly through predation foxes and cats um, that's a real spanner in the works and I one of the things I, I wonder about is how, how can we support more healthy litter turnover in the landscape and again it's a wicked question because we don't have a good answer thank you does that answer any of the questions well the, the question was around how, how fire can assist. Um, yeah. That's cool. I think we can come back to it. If there's, <coughs> if there's interest, we can come back to that and revisit. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steph. So there's a lot of similarities between how we, what we're looking for in healthy bushland and managing for healthy bushland as what we're looking for in a pastured situation. So, um, in this pasture, you can see, can't see any soil again. Um, it's full of um, yellow stalky litter in between um, the green leaves. So it's um, grown plenty of biomass um, above the soil. It would have very large root network and um, it would be um, sequestering plenty of soil carbon by those sugary root exudates. The, and uh, root sloughing and via uh, the particulate litter cycling. So we, when things are going well, when we're managing well, we're getting um, great soil function through all humic pools.
when we look into the sward, um, here we can see that there is visible litter decay in the pasture base. So there's brown leaves, and yellow leaves in various state of decay. And this provides, I guess, this provides really good nutrient cycling in our pasture um, by producing litter and then having it decompose um, grasses and, and all plants basically produce our own fertilizer. Here we can see fungal hyphae right in, in the, at the soil surface. So that's a really good sign that our pasture is functioning really well, it's cycling nutrients really well, and that that litter is actively breaking down. So just like in the bush, we need, um, microbes are really valuable in keeping everything ticking over. Steph, well, just sorry to interrupt, while we're here, there's, there's a question from Darren in the Diamond Creek area around organic carbon and organic matter. Mm -hmm. We've had some soil tests done, which actually found that the, the carbon, the organic carbon content was almost double the recommended and organic matter was also re um, determined to be very high. Mm -hmm. Are there, there are any potential impacts or side effects of having too much that could contribute to poor soil? Um, that you're aware of? Or maybe there's something else going on that may be leading to um, poor quality soil or hard packed clays in a hobby farm was it, situation. Was it poor quality soil? Uh, it's just noted as poor soils and a hard packed okay. clay, but it's, and still a test reveals high levels of carbon and organic matter. So I guess the one thing that I, I know when um, you're taking soil cores and, and taking samples, they're a little bit fraught with danger because um, the, the only way in my head I can explain that how um, you might end up with, you know, very high levels of soil, organic matter and carbon when you don't have, when, when it's, you know, very obviously poor soil would be if you, if in your sample you included too much above ground um, kind of uh, litter material, so that will skew the results of your soil core because those, um, like say the, the some semi decomposed composted um, bits in the top of the core, if you didn't remove them before you took the core, that 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 would definitely skew your results. Okay, but you would suggest getting soil test is a good option to to better understand what's going on. It is an option. However, I think we can draw a lot from what's happening above the ground, what our plants are doing, um, whether they are improving, whether they're getting bigger, whether we're, you know, seeing new um, seedlings germinating and establishing it and doing really well. If we've got all those things happening, then again, we're heading in the, in the right direction and, um, soil tests you can do them but if i say I did them right now and then i did them in a year's time if i was taking my um land say my landscape was in really bad state and then i improved it yeah i'd see I, i'm confident you'd see improvements in the soil organic matter levels but we know exactly what we need to be managing for by looking what's hap at what's happening above the ground. So provided we keep doing that, and yeah, it can it can be a little bit fraught with danger because yeah. yeah. then it, you start, you know, um, mincing tiny numbers, and you know, if you're only storing soil like soil um, organic matter in the first couple of centimeters of soil, you haven't got that much room for error compared to say you're managing. Um, you're in the US in like the the wheat belt and you've got meters and meters of topsoil you've got a lot more soil depth in order to make those um like to undertake those measurements yeah so it's a good idea to get out there and really observe what's going on definitely uh, read the landscape yeah yeah cool i hope that helps darren thanks steph so in this slide um we can see this is Two different pictures. These, this pasture, it's already been grazed, but again, we can't see any bare soil. It's still got a plen plenty of thick litter coverage that our grasses will regrow through. 
um, when we have that nice coverage of mulch, just like in when we're managing bushland, um, there is um, the soil's kept cool, um, limited risk of erosive processes, and um, mulch is a fantastic weed mat in our pasture. So where um, if we had any, say, a little capeweed uh, seed that was wanting to germinate, it would likely get stuck in, in this thick litter. However, when pasture management goes wrong, we get stuck with pasture that looks like this. So when grasses are overgrazed and become weakened, we end up with bare patches in between. And then that leaves room to have annual broadleafy species like capeweed or um, dock or marshmallow or anything like that to come in and um, inhabit those bare spaces. While um, this is a very natural, normal process, so annuals um, are primary colonisers. When there's a bare bit, they come in and they act as kind of nature's band-aid. So annual weeds coming into the system, we often think about it as, as a problem, but it's really a, a symptom that um, our management needs adjustment. So um, the best thing to do in, in this case is actually to give the grasses more time to recover. But pasture management, it's not easy. It might sound simple, but it's, it's not that easy in practice. So yes, we need to um, aim for and maintain 100% ground cover and litter throughout the year. But doing that in practice, there are a few strategies we can use. So um, by avoiding overgrazing, it means that our plants are not weakened by being re-eaten too soon before they're ready. So if our plants haven't regrown um, all their leaves and their litter and their roots, um, if we come and graze them before they get to that full, fully regrown point, um, just like um, when we have deer eat, chronically eating the bush, things get weaker and weaker and weaker. So we need to achieve that in practice, um, flexible stocking rates. So stocking rates that match the conditions and that um, match the kind of rainfall we had and the amount of feed grass we've produced. We can also use in, um, especially on, on small hobby, hobby properties, containment zones where we might, we can restrict and really control access to pasture to keep that recovery time long enough. This can be helped and made much easier by fencing and water improvements. Once we've got to the point where we've mastered the 100% ground cover and litter, then if we keep, we can keep pushing the boundaries um, and we can um, aim for things like increasing diversity in our pasture. So in um, Nilambic, we don't have that much um, summer, many summer active grass species, but out west, this is much more applicable. So bringing back summer active grasses like kangaroo grass um, can add fantastic diversity to our pastures. So we've got species that are actively growing in winter, actively growing in summer, and um, our soil microbes are being fed um, throughout the year. So that's, that's the ideal. Um, but we need to start with, as a, as a primary aim, getting back to that ground, high ground cover and litter, um, and then we can start aiming for diverse pastures. Steph? Mm -hmm. Yeah, while we're here, um, with been typing away, so I may miss it. It's like, this is also appropriate for pretty much any any animal or any livestock that may be on properties yes. that people are managing. So I know we've had a uh, a mention from one of the participants participants from Northeast Vic who has goats and looking to sort of look to to build carbon in the soil. Um, so I imagine the 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 idea of over not overstocking and giving areas plenty of time to rest applies across. The, the land management with animals perspective. Yeah, definitely. These principles will work whether you have, you know, sheep, horses, cows, alpacas, pastured poultry, or goats, anything. Um, it's all about what's what are the grasses doing and, and monitoring for their needs and then making um, making our animal management fit and adjust adjust around the needs of our, our vegetation. Okay. So 
following on from that, um, there's another question relating to kangaroos and the, yeah. the combination of grazing pressures from kangaroos and, and how might that sort of interlink with um, the management using, using stock? Yeah, so it, it is a real challenge. So, but one strategy I find quite effective is we get to know our brew mobs. Um, we know, we roughly know their grazing pressure. Um, and therefore that's something that we can, I guess, account for and manage for and work back from. So for example, at home, I have a little, some of the property which is, has root really exclusion fencing. And those, past, those paddocks have a recovery time of four to six months because when they're actively growing, um, there's, there's no kind of chronic root browsing. But in other areas of the property where I have my mob of kangaroos and they kind of move through, through the valley every day and they spend probably a few hours a day um, grazing in those areas of the property, they need a lot more time to recover because they're getting eaten every day. So they are being technically overgrazed. Um, and while I can't necessarily fix that, change that, I can adjust for it in how I manage my animals. So because I know that those areas have kind of ongoing root browsing, I've extended out the recovery time for how I manage my livestock out to one year in those areas. And I find that that is, that gives me um, still really good um, ground cover and litter outcomes. And is it a, a highly productive, you know, I can get X million passes a year and, and it, it's not a, like a high performance dairy pasture by any means, but it does the job. It is um, functioning really well. I have no sediment movement. Uh, there's no bare bits. So that's, that's, that's how I manage and um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so just like in the bushland settings, um, we talked about exclusion patches and, and just like trial sites and monitoring. We can have um, monitoring patches in, in pasture systems too. And I find these are a really effective way of teasing out exactly how long our recovery time needs to be. So most of our issues in, in grazing stem from having a recovery time that's too short. So animals coming back too soon chronically and we end up with weak grasses and then we have the annual weeds coming in. It's a mess. But while we're nutting out exactly what our system needs, the best way to do that is in a small area. So you've got complete control over it. You can decide when animals go in and when animals come out. You can keep track of what's germinating in there. Oh, I've got some new wallaby grass coming up in there. Oh, I can see that, you know, this is doing really well or I haven't got this weed. So that would be, um, that's probably the, the lowest risk um, and the best diagnostic tool for pasture. If you've got um, horses or any, um, any livestock really, and you're in Nilambic, you might be interested in undertaking the Equiculture Online Land Management course. Um, we've had more than 20 people sign up so far, and it's been really well received in the community. And it is completely online and has um, modules that take you through all aspects of property management, including pasture, um, some animal health um, staff, um, property layouts and fencing, watering, all those things that um, land management land managers with passion need to nut out. So if you are interested, it's on the website. And that brings us, well, we're still um, somewhat on the pasture stuff, but almost at the garden stuff, it brings us to weeds. So <clears throat> Like I said before, weeds are a symptom of management. Um, however, does that mean we shouldn't remove them? Should we remove them? And it really depends. So if it's in a pasture situation and it's an annual weed, might just be 
symptom of management, um, we can remove it or we can not remove it. I find that whether we um, spray or we don't spray or we mow or we don't, don't mow, the long-term outcomes of our pasture come down to getting that recovery time long enough. So whether you um, act on annual weeds in the pasture is up to you. Okay. Steph, yeah. just jumping in again, there's a, a question um, with relation to the use of herbicides. And okay. are you aware of whether the use of herbicides affects the soil microbes and maybe therefore the, the, the capacity for the soil to take in carbon or hold carbon? So I guess the most conservative answer is yes, it does. And that minimising herbicide use ultimately um, is the best thing we can do for our soil microbiome. Um, microbes are very sensitive and we can, while there is um, some literature to say that, you know, herbicide X is, you know, it breaks down in this amount of time and doesn't have too much of an impact. Can we really say that? Like, I don't, I don't think we know enough about microbes and um, our yeah. soil microbiomes to be able to genuinely say that herbicides don't impact our um, soil flora. So sure. if we can avoid using herbicides, I would. So as an alternative, perhaps, to, and you may, you may discuss a little bit further, say you've got weeds like this, like you can see here, there's lots of thistles and um, a classic for the Nilambic environment is cape weed. Mm -hmm. what, what, what about the value of, say, mulching over cape weed? Or, and if you were, what would you do it with? Or would you grow it out? Like, what might be a solution to the classic? Yeah. So some people, um, you might, if it's almost setting seed, some people uh, mow with a catcher. Um, however, when we're taking that long-term view, we need to think about, well, what do we want to be there? Because we've got, we're stuck at Cape Weed now, but we know we want to be at perennial, like great perennial pasture grasses, if it's a pasture. Um, so what are the pasture grasses doing? Usually if you dig around the Cape Weed, you can find them and they're little and they're tiny and they're just, they're just overgrazed. So if we keep, it's hard to put our blinkers on and not look at the Cape Weed, but if we can, and we just focus on the needs of those grasses, and waiting until they've regrown and they've got all fresh litter, then I find the cape weed just drops out quite magically. Even when, even when we know that there is an enormous quantity of weed seed in the seed bank, I think we get a bit stuck on the seed bank when all the seed bank literature says that we've got huge quantities of annual seeds, but only tiny quantities of perennial seeds. What is in the seed bank doesn't necessarily reflect what germinates and establishes and that comes down to management only. Yeah, sure. And I know like from personal experience and from talking to a lot of people that do look after their land and they learn to read the land, actually the weeds always become like a fingerprint for what's going on at soil level. Yeah. They, they, they indicate acid soils, waterlogged soils, compacted soils, clay soils, lack of nutrients, excess nutrients. Mm. So it's actually worth getting in and really doing some research into your problem species because they also indicate the conditions you're dealing with. And sometimes when you shift those conditions to a new, um, I suppose, pH or a new mm. level of humus or moisture, actually a lot of those weeds actually find they can't compete with those yeah. conditions. They're just yeah. indicating um, something that's not going so well in that landscape, mm. you know, favorable conditions for weeds. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yep, and plus when we're when we're managing for vigorous perennial species, the the I guess soil biome shifts so that it's not as favourable microbially for those annual species to come in and and take control. So that was pasture. On the right hand side, we have bushland and woody weeds, and I guess this is. A little bit of a different kettle of fish in that if if we if we choose not to control this well then will it get out of control won't it get out of control maybe um, we, we, we need to be more mindful and a bit less um, kind of uh, whereas in the pasture we can think about well how will 
uh, succession naturally come along and, and, and play in. When, it come, when we're stuck with these invasive woody weeds, sometimes the best thing to do is just to be monitoring it and catch the issue when it gets small. Um, because the bigger it is, the more likely someone, the, the only option is to go in with um, a fossil fuel powered machine or a herbicide. So if we, we really just want to avoid that if possible and, and nip things when they're little and we can ideally get them out by hand. Yeah, it's a good idea trying to chip out some of these woody weeds. I know there's, uh, there's a lot of um, ideas around getting goats into the gullies to clear the goats out. I know once upon a time when I was a bit more naive, I, I tried that and naively they were, they were eating blackberries that were fruiting. Um, so the problem only got worse. So there's being very mindful of if we're going to use livestock to manage these sorts of conditions about when they're in, how long they're in for, as you've been yeah. saying in life. Yeah, in the end, it was sort of growing them out that made a lot of the difference. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, livestock can be a good option, but again, they're in to be managed well. If that's something that um, landholders are interested in, there are, uh, I guess, commercial operators who offer higher goat services that know no and understand goats and um, vegetation really well and can guide you in how to use animals as, as the the management tool and do it in a way that has really positive ecological outcomes. So now we've talked about weeds, um, we're going to move into the garden. Weeds in the garden can have um, a wonderful mulching effect and they make great compost fodder. Um, but do we want all weeds? No, we like to have lots of plants that we do want. So. Um, I'm just going to run through a few different strategies of how we might um, and how we might influence our um, plants in the garden and our growing spaces to increase um, our soil humus. Minimising fertiliser use is a big one because we know that when we add especially highly soluble fertilisers um, like very uh, water soluble nitrogen sources or um, more for soluble for phosphorus sources, then our plants get lazy. And ordinarily, um, our plants would, via their roots, they would talk to their soil mycorrhizal fungi, they would um, trade sugars for um, phosphor, you know, little phosphorus ions, and that is how the, this wheat plant would normally get its phosphorus. However, when we pump on, when we provide copious amounts of, you know, excess phosphorus or, or nitrogen or other nutrients and minerals, then the plant doesn't actually need to talk to its soil mycorrhizae and they can just soak it up willy nilly and they don't need to, to work as hard and we can really disrupt that microbial bridge. So if we are going to use phosphorus, if we are going to use fertilizers, we need to be thoughtful about if we need to use them. If we do use them, they need to be sparing and we want them to ideally to, to be in a, a less processed form, so um, uh, less soluble. We, we want the, our soil microbes to um, break them up and, and work them up and have them and then have our, our soil microbiome feed them back to our plants. Choosing perennials over annuals can make gardening a lot less work, um, but it also means that we have plants that are growing, they've got long lifespans, they've got lots of, over their life, they can be constantly growing and um, feeding our, our soil microbiomes. They've got diverse root habits um, and timing, so we can have plants that are actively growing during the winter and then other species during the summer, and getting those diverse um, growth habits and diverse root networks is really valuable for boosting that um, soil biome. We can choose dense plantings and avoid bare bits and um, perennial buffers are fantastic around veggie beds when we've got these little pockets of annual garden that are um, when we think of annuals in nature, they're the nature's band-aid, the veggie beds are actually highly unstable um, 
system. So we um, unfortunately, no perennial heirloom tomatoes exist yet. So we do still need to um, grow annuals, um, but there are lots of strategies we can use in the annual garden. This is just a few. We can draw from um, various horticultural literature and what happens in um, cover cropping. I'm going to start with talking about how we can use cover crops. Cover crops are a really great low hanging fruit option for our veggie beds. Sometimes we, when, we're, when we're summer gardeners only, um, we might leave beds just sitting empty over the winter and then we get them all ready for the spring summer season and then we just let them kind of go. While weeds do, again, weeds do a great job of sequestering soil carbon and providing soil uh, function and structure and um, mulch, they can be a bit hard um, then to get your beds turned over and ready for um, the next planting season and sometimes they go to seed when we don't want them to and, and then we just make a bit extra of extra work for ourselves. But cover crops can be a great, I guess, controlled um, um, activity where we, in summer, maybe we grow more, um, more crops in summer than we do in winter. We grow our cover crops, then in over, as soon as say we ripped out those tomatoes, we could put in a cover crop, then chop it down before it goes to seed. That's a great compost fodder. And it meant that our, our bed was busy, our soil microbiome was well fed over the winter, and then it's all ready for whatever we want to plant in summer. On that note, uh, starting seedlings in trays can be another good option so that we can shorten the time when there's not much happening in our garden bed. So just starting um, in and then planting in out seedlings might mean that there's um, maybe even a whole month where there's a lot, um, where there would otherwise be a lot, not much activity in the garden. We can um, um, keep the soil pumping more consistently. Some crop, cover crop ideas you might use. So in the winter, we can use all different types of um, grains and uh, put stars next to the, to the legumes, just because if we're gonna choose to add legumes while they do fix nitrogen, we wanna, in, we wanna combine them with a, a grain crop. And this is just because um, they don't necessarily grow a huge amount of volume in their bodies and um, that means that we're, we're not generating much above ground biomass, which would otherwise be great compost fodder. So just blend them with the grain. In the summer, um, you could use all manner of, of species. Um, my best tip would be go to the health food store, choose an, an organic, non-hulled, non-roasted seed or grain, and um, you can pick up a, a you know, a little bit for your cover crop experiments really cheaply, really easily. And there, that's what I do. In these photos, that's our Romanesco broccolis, and they've actually got a chook food cover crop underneath them. And they were a really, really great brassica crop. Did you actually get any chickpeas with that? Um, not really. I haven't yet mastered chickpeas. No, it's a tricky one. Have you? No, not chickpeas. I've actually got some in, but I haven't mastered. I've tried soybeans as well without success, even and they were inoculated. No. <laughs> and peanuts. Maybe I'm the peanut. <laughs> awesome. So we're on to our last topic, um, and hopefully everyone's still awake. <laughs> so, you know, Steph, we've got 20 minutes to go, so there are a few questions that we might pull out sort of towards the end when we do get to the Q&A. Oh, perfect. Okay. So We're almost if, at the Q&A. Yeah. So if there are any more questions about what you've seen or if we haven't managed to bring it out through the sort of the, the banter or the discussion, you know, um, get it in and we'll try and make a point of, of covering off your, your queries. Okay. Preaching about lawns is a serious faux pas. However, for the sake of soil carbon, I'm going to go there. Here's Maggie, my dog. She loves a good, healthy, regenerating lawn. It's fantastic for playing fetch on and um, all manner of things, rolling in chook poo and such. Um, in the lawn, we can treat it a bit like um, healthy pasture in a way. Um, 
mowing it a bit less frequently, raising the cutter deck, um, avoiding using the catcher and, and leaving the clippings to um, fall where they are, um, are great options for allowing, I guess, normal increased um, photosynthesis in our lawn and increased above ground nutrient cycling. If we've got a mixed lawn and we're wanting to promote a particular species, say we had um, we had some weeping grass we wanted to um, promote, but then we had other species that we we weren't so fond of and we really wanted the, the weeping grass to win. We'd be waiting until the weeping grass has set seed and it's really watching it and watching for the needs of the species that we're wanting to promote and we wait until it had set seed and then we might mow it. So um, I know people that have um, turned their lawns quite successfully back from mixed um, back to weeping grass and wallaby grass just through mowing timing. It does work quite well, um, but it just looks a bit untidy between between mows. But that, again, all for the soil carbon. And Steph, just got one more. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, sort of maybe it's taking it back a step, but it also links in with the the mowing idea with the the cover crops. How do you deal with your cover crops? Do you do you just blitz them back on and leave them on top of the soil to promote root root sloughing, or do you dig them in? Like what, what's your general treatment for so, the, the cover crops in a productive garden? Or so what, would really you, what would you suggest is the best way what, to do it? Maybe okay. particularly for carbon. So it depends what we're putting back in, like what we're putting in next. So right now I've got one, it's a wheat bed that I just cut down two weeks ago and um i chopped it all off and i put all the stalks in the compost bin so that's great compost food i didn't want to i guess technically i could have left them there and i could have technically planted the onions into the like all the stalks but they're only little onions i was concerned they're going to get lost and also concerned um that it would be not as easy for me to i guess identify wheat weeds and and weed appropriately given that onions are not overly tolerant of weeds. That's a very particular example to the crop I was growing. Let's say I was chopping down a crop and I was putting in something a bit tougher like potatoes or you know big established tomatoes. I might chop it down, maybe I might wait a couple of weeks while we have a lot of those roots breaking down. While in terms of soil carbon, the best thing to do would be to plant directly into the stubble and, and have things, I guess, constantly going. The challenge is that sometimes when I've tried to do that in the past, I actually the, the root structure of the cover crop is too strong for me to actually get plants in there. So I guess that's, yeah, that's how I've, where I've got to at the moment. And it, it's, I guess it's a balance between we, want to grow cover crops, but then we also need to have the soil somewhat um, loose and, and plantable for the next crop. Yes, I imagine a lot of people have their own, have developed their own preferences and techniques yeah. that are effective. What do you use? Um, look, I get to the point where if plants are getting a bit leggy and sometimes I'll just cut them at ground level and leave the roots in there mm -hmm. and either compost or sometimes just leave the plants to decompose. That's not always the best thing because that decomposition sometimes takes some of the mm -hmm. nutrient load from the soil. Um, yeah, I use a, a bit of a mix. I don't, I probably could do with a bit more cover cropping, to be honest. And I like to prefer it in some ways just to sort of do a bit of crop rotation and plant crops throughout the year and let beds rest for a season um, with some sort of, mulch i tend to use herby mulches in the garden and woody mulches around the fruit trees mm -hmm. so trying to sort of mimic nature and that tends to sort of build up the the bacteria and the the symbiotic um fungi and i suppose microorganisms suitable to those plants a bit better mm. um, yeah I have a, I'm, I'm probably more of a, a fruit tree grower than a vegetable gardener to be honest now very good yeah All right well there you go if anyone's got any fruit tree questions and your man and this is the last slide. So just a few take home um, points. We, if we are going to bolster our soil carbon, 
starts with photosynthesis. So when in doubt, grow more plants, grow more plants year round, closer plant spacing, um, and just more, more photosynthetic area. Um, we want to have enough plants that we've got stable leaf litter and stable sediments, and we're not we're capturing um, any, um, I guess, ab above ground um, litter cycling. And we don't want to have we don't want to lose any soil or any um, bits down into the into the waterways. If we're managing pasture or um, we've got some grazing and browsing influences, we that that needs to be balanced. So not too much, not too little, um, and at the right time. And once we've got all that sorted, then can we be aiming for increasing diversity? We know that diverse um, plantings have result in um, increased um, root exudation. So that's it from me. Cool, nice one. Thanks, Steph. Um, that was great, learnt plenty during that one. There's opportunity now if you've got any questions. We've still got a couple of minutes that we're quite willing to, to hang around and pop some, and answer some questions for you. Um, there's a bit of chat about some information about understanding soil tests for pastures on the chat at the moment. Thank oh, okay. For, yeah, thanks for that one. Um, a quick look at the... There's, there's a comment mm -hmm. that could probably be looked at too with regards to... It came in early and it's been sitting there for a while with regards to hump humus and mm -hmm. um, with, with humus, I'll read the question, read the, the, the question. I thought humus was by definition resistant carbon. So how are microbial bodies part of that? Isn't most humus the end product of lignin degra degradation? Gee, I can... So Sorry. the first part of the question, I thought, humus was resistant carbon i mean it is like it is resistant as in yeah. it's it's not like particulate carbon in that it there's not um it's not still undergoing composting hey how, how you say but it's it's not charcoal either so maybe it's just it maybe we're just got a terminology um overlap in terms of the resistant carbon um, as, a, as a word on the lignin side of things. So I guess on the one hand, if we, if we're breaking down, um, we're breaking down litter and breaking down roots and plant bodies, some of that does end up as um, humus. However, more, I guess, old school literature, talks about building soil carbon only through that kind of physical breakdown of plant bodies and plant roots. However, more, I guess, newer literature, the newer school of thinking have included um, the Shuri root exudates as a, a really important pool of soil carbon that previously we weren't accounting for, for and weren't measuring. So um, sometimes I often read read things that are referring to um, our very old school literature that didn't include those sugary root exudates and um, I guess they're considered quite a game changer in how we think about managing carbon in the landscape and um, yeah. yeah okay uh, so that that's sort of a piece of I suppose more more recent sort of developments in the study of soil soil structures and soil science when we yeah. think about it, it's much easier to kind of measure plant bodies and plant roots rather than try and measure how much sugars they release into their so into the soil around them. So it's yeah, we yeah. Can, you can understand scientists study what's what's yeah. easy and what they can study. Um, if I'm sure, if if back in the eighties that they could measure sugary root exudates, they would have. Cool. Got a, another one from Michelle. Um, what about using standard bush mulch from local councils or nurseries? Does that help soil carbon at all? Or is it mainly just to provide water <clears throat> retention? What do you think? So I guess adding mulch on top, we can enhance um, that above ground litter cycling. And if it's an area that we, um, we're stabilizing or it doesn't have, an, it's not producing enough of its own mulch, 
then adding mulch back is a, a really good option, especially if it's a re-veg site. Um, ultimately though, um, that above ground litter turnover has a, a smaller influence in our total humus pool that we end up with and, and most of what we have is from those sugar exudates. So yes, if the mulch is, the mulch will help you establish the plants, but ultimately it's, it's the living plants that are going to do the heavy lifting in, in the long run yeah. in bolstering our soil carbon. Okay, and I, I, it's probably worth suggesting also mm -hmm. that by providing extra nutrient for the microorganisms to, to thrive in and to store, to store a little bit of moisture, you're actually providing more of the, the templates from which the plants can actually source their, their yeah. nutrient. Because the plants don't actually get their nutrient directly from mulch, they get it from the fluids and the liquids and basically as those nutrients are soluble in the soils. Mm. So, um, you know, as a fruit tree grower, I tend not to work too much on the soil itself. I work on what's going onto the soil, working with, with sort of mu nutrients and building up, um, I suppose, more of the, the forest replicating mycorrhizal fungi around fruit trees by adding woody mulches, rocks, you know, there's not unusual to see rocks the size of basketballs under fruit trees to provide little, you know, um, store a bit of heat, logs, prunings, um, yep. trying to sort of mimic nature to some extent. Now there's a question, Steph, um, is it possible to put up, there's a slide, the cover crop slide again, could you just pop that up? Um, and maybe we could take a few, go on with a few more questions. Uh, I, I hope so. <laughs> That would make sense. And what about is it increasing soil um, carbon sequestration in lawns that are frequently mowed? Is it possible to do that? Or... Sorry, they're, they're frequently low. Frequently mowed. Sorry. Oh, mowed. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why I said uh, um, I guess lawns are um, you know people's babies in in many households and. You know, the, they want to have very beautiful lawns and got to be perfect. Yeah. I guess it's the balance between we need that the grasses need to have enough leaf area in order to be photosynthesizing optimally. And if we're cutting them too frequently or too short, then we interfere with that. So um, even just raising the cutting deck a little bit or cutting slightly less often is would go some way in order in not disrupting that so much mm -hmm. weeping grass makes a really nice lawn and um while it's i guess um relatively small it's not it's not a very tall species um when it puts up its seed heads it, it can get um a bit tall but compared to a lot of our um imported European grasses, it's, it's yeah. um, very, sm it's very small and. Um, okay, there's a few questions option. still. Yeah, there's a few questions. We've only got about six minutes to go. So we might see if we can get through a few of them reasonably quickly if we can. Um, Rob's asking, he's got areas of bare hard clay that are scoured by water at every rain. Any suggestions for protecting it so something will grow on it? So if um, you've got any logs that you can um, put down on contour or you could do those coir rolls. Um, Slow the flow. Yeah, and anything that will just trap um, uh, like litter or sediment moving over the surface, then behind the logs or behind the, the coir rolls, um, you might be able to add, so say you could, you might add a, a bit of bush mulch that would be held behind that log and then you begin planting in there. And it's a slow process, obviously, but um, we just start from, you might start from that, those lines on contour and then just keep building and building and building. And um, yeah, it'll, if you're, if you're back at subsoil, it's going to be slow, but yeah, do have a crack. Cool. Okay, there's a thanks for that. Another one from Natasha. In an agricultural setting, do you re recommend tarping to cover the soil when there is no time to grow a cover crop in between crops? Um, 
can it can tarping be harmful? Well, the, the you, biodynamic I mean, farmer on a tour said she doesn't use a harp, a tarp because it might affect the soil biology. I guess it can. You can. I mean, I, I can. I use tarping to kill kaikuyu that is invading my garden bed. So, if it can kill kaikuyu, it can probably kill quite a lot of soil microbes. Mm. Um, so, I'd say yes. Um, a really quick cover is buckwheat. Even if you've got, only got three weeks, buckwheat is a good option. Um, so, but yeah. Um, otherwise, instead of using a tarp, maybe a different mulch, um, like a physical, a physical straw or um, There's even like, mulch. I know I used to, every now and again, use things like potato sacks, Hessian potato sacks. Mm. So using, using organic materials um, where possible. It depends, obviously it depends on the scale that you're dealing with. Yeah, and um, then what you have at hand. Yeah. Um, Robert's asking, is pea straw added to an indigenous garden a good thing? <laughs> so, generally, I, so pea straw, if we compare it to say uh, a yuki mulch, Pistro will um, break down quite a bit more quickly and it will have more um, rapidly available nutrients and definitely higher available nitrogen than um, a, a chunky eucalyptus mulch or um, other woody mulch. But it really depends what you're doing. So some might say, well, you, you might get more weeds or um, you might be a bit overkill for your native plants. If you're interested, I would just do a comparison, try half with one mulch and half with the other and, and see what the difference is. And then you can use that to guide how, what you use in the future and um, which, as to which establish better or which have more weeds or less weeds or, um, yeah you know, better longer term health, health outcomes. Yeah. What about the idea of leaving some of the smaller weeds growing sort of in the garden or around fruit trees, you know, do you see them as help or hinder? Oh, helpful. Definitely. Yeah. I think they, they hold the soil together and, and some weeds, not all a weed in my, the way I see it is an unloved plant. Obviously it's often in a place that it's not wanted. Um, but you know, I've actually come to become friends with dandelion, you know, the flower, it's, like, it's almost like a medicine cabinet in a plant. I will harvest dandelion root and roast them up, add it to the morning coffee. It's really good. So try and try and make friends with the weeds where you can, because most of the weeds have come in with some sort of medicinal value in the early days and they've established themselves. So consider whether, whether it's a weed or an unloved plant and what, is, what are its benefits. Mm, that's a very good point. I hadn't, hadn't thought about the, you know, importing for a reason and the medicinal quality. So that's... Mm. Thank you. So maybe that's more philosophy. It's very philosophical. So wise, Ian. Oh, and um, <laughs> Stuart, Stuart's got a query around humic acids um, yeah. that some suppliers provide. We only got a short time to go. And mentioning that some of them, or as far as he knows, all are extracted from brown coal. So why isn't it, mm. why isn't brown coal provided or promoted as a soil improver? I... Man. I'm not sure. I'm going to read about that because I, I can't answer that question. That is fascinating. Interesting you should mention it. I have some brown coal here. Keeping in mind, part of my role is climate and energy. I keep a bit of brown coal. Um, you can, there are actually a few studies where brown coal is used as a soil improver. Um, basically, it's fossilized plants and whatever fell on the, in the peaty swamp millions of years ago compressed into a lump. So, it's possibly something that I know in Tasmania, there's a, a group I used to have some, some communications with where they have large amounts of black coal and they were looking to pyrolyze black coal to generate electricity and heat. And by pyrolyzing it, they would also have biochar as a byproduct. So you can, like this stuff, there's probably better to use it. I mean, my, this is my opinion. It's possibly a better thing to use as a soil improver than burning it to generate electricity. You know, maybe there's capacity to regenerate some of our destroyed soils through uh, maybe some of the incredible amounts of stored carbon we have in the soil. Um, a bit of redistribution might help, but that's just my opinion. So, sorry. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I yeah, I I'm going to read more about that because I I guess that's would be quite an ethical dilemma. Um, okay, using um, fossil sources. Yeah, and maybe look, we've still got a number of people on online. Um, I don't know. I will at this stage. I will say thank you. Um, I'm happy to stay around for a few more minutes and try and get a few questions answered because there's a couple still sitting there. Um, but Steph, yourself, are you happy to hang around for a few more minutes? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's not twisting your arm or anything, it's just asking. Um, so there's a, a comment, I suppose, maybe to sort of get a bit sort of a response to it about fire um, around a lot of a lot of species need fire for seed germination. Also, the smoke from fires helps some species yeah. of plants to have a chemical reaction to make the seeds. Any, any comment you'd like to add to that one? Um, I think, like I said before, you know, fire is a tool we can use. Um, should it be the only tool? No. Um, definitely it has, like that commenter said, really important role in the life cycle of, of many Australian species, but I guess the challenge becomes when we're, when we're burning too much or of um, too, too frequently or at too high intensity that we might not be getting enough of the benefits of the litter cycling. Um, okay. Cool. Um, we're almost there. Um, looking, there's a bit of a comment about, um, Oh, it's just disappeared. Plant closer plant spacing, encouraging plant diseases. So planting too densely in the in the veggie garden. Um, um, can you plant too close? I suppose. And what about um, pruning? So I like to use. It's called um, biointensive. Um, growing um, John Jeevan's work. I use their plant spacing and they're quite a bit closer than a lot of the seed packets or the um, row spacing, the you know, traditional row spacing, because they're all planted in grids. And I guess their philosophy is that when we have plants um, a bit closer together and when they're, you know, their leaves are almost touching at maturity, then we have, um, it creates a nice humid, um, microclimate around the growing plants and that helps them conserve water and plants really like that apparently. Yeah, right. um, cool. I guess on the other, on the flip side, when we do have higher humidity or things closer together, we can get some diseases, especially like fungal things. If it's a close plant spacing combined with a hot, um, humid summer, maybe yeah. we're going to have more issues, but, I guess, are we thinking about the, um, I guess, the holistic health of our plants and do they have everything they need in terms of a really healthy soil where they can draw the, the kind of um, nutrients they need, all the nutrients they need? Um, yeah. Have they been planted and, and watered properly? And I guess how we're supporting them to be resistant and resilient in, in the face of diseases? Absolutely. It's and a lot of it's about getting out there and watching your plants, watching what's happening and, it, you know, do a bit of research into companion planting because there are some plants that really don't like each other. So if you're going to just sort of bung, it, it's not as simple as just bunging a whole lot of plants in sometimes. So, yeah. you know, some plants will thrive. Um, you know, you, there are the idea of planting guilds of plants that work well together. The old classic of corn, and marrow and beans from, from South America. So it's worth a bit of research into what grows well together, what doesn't grow so well together and how, you know, just, it's just like communities of, of people or other animals, you know, there are some that support and there are some that detract. So, um, you know, it's been looked at quite a bit and it's worth, there's a, there's a lot more in there to um, yeah. explore. Cool. Um, it's 8.35. I think there's, there's one that's, sitting there for about the last nine or 11 minutes. It's about sphagnum moss. How to get rid of it in the lawn. Um, I'm not sure. Is, is it a physical removal? 
Is it there? I imagine it indicates moisture and compacted soils. So I guess um, what do we have grasses growing around um, and what are they doing? Ideally, we want them to get big and strong and them to crowd out the moss. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. we could use our, um, our previous mowing tips, so reducing mowing frequency or cutter height. Um, you could use, you could, maybe you could try um, top dressing or adding some kind of mulch layer um, that was, mm. grasses are quite happy to grow up through mulch. I'm not sure um, what, what sphagnum moss does <laughs> if you put mulch over the top. Yeah. You can try. I must admit, I'm not really sure with that one. But I'm sure there's something on the interweb that will, will sort of back up a number of solutions. <laughs> Could be could be adding cardboard, could be garden mulch, could be you know, potato sacks, it could be old clothes, old cotton or wool clothes that you don't need anymore instead of throwing them into recycling or um, even worse, maybe off to landfill, maybe they could be composted and used as a mulch as well. But might. No, that's all good. All right, Steph, um, it's got a few minutes over. Questions have pretty much wrapped up there's I hope we've addressed everybody's suggestions and everybody's queries at this stage um thank you all for coming thank you so much to Steph clap for me thank you for thank your presentation you. and your your wisdom and your support um for those that are still online and if you're a Neil and Big resident please recognize that Steph is the the land management officer so if you've got any queries or any cons any thoughts about looking after your land Steph is a great person to connect with um, Absolutely. That, Call that's the role, anytime. isn't it, Steph? I'm here for you. That's right. So if you're after some support, um, please get in touch with Steph. And Steph's also part of a team. There's There must be around another six or eight dedicated officers working in the environment space um, that are really there to support the, the community in, um, of Nilambic. So please use the staff. Sometimes it can be a, a bit of a quiet existence if, if we can't actually hear what the, the community's after. So yeah, reach out because there are people there to support. Um, Absolutely. And I mean, this is, this talk has been relatively um, generalized, but um, we can provide site visits and I guess really customized advice for your um, particular site. If you're interested in doing any, I guess, replanting projects or um, other awesome. um, environmental projects, do get, get in, in touch and um, we can, through the land management incentive program we can co-fund environmental work so um, if that's something that you are interested in pursuing yet yeah, do do get in touch and i'd love to be able to help nice one thank you steph and if you've Very got good. anything more related to sustainability um there's a couple of us there for that as well solar awesome. energy climate mitigation adaptation and advocacy that's that's also going on so please get in touch all the best. Good luck with your, your gardening, your, your life, I suppose. Um, thanks again, Steph. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ian. Cheers and good night. So, all right, we've managed to um, cover off. I think we cover, covered off all the questions. Stop the recording. Thank you.